This week's episode of This Is Only a Test is brought to you by App River. If you own a business, no matter how big or small, email hackers and scammers are probably coming after you. App River can make your company a much harder target. They have affordable services like spam and virus filtering, email encryption, and web threat protection to keep you safe. They also back their services with live 24-7 U.S.-based support at no additional charge. Try App River services free for 30 days by visiting appriver.com slash test. That's A P P. R-I-V-E-R dot com slash test. Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, November 9th, 2017, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. This is only a test. Welcome, everyone. How's everyone doing on this fine <laughs> week of podcasting? Wednesday slash Thursday. We record on Wednesdays. You'll hear it on Thursdays. Doing well. Karen Williams? Doing well. Doing, doing well. well. Yep. I poured hot coffee into my iced coffee, and I'm feeling strange about it. You're just, so you that just have a strange thing. Lukewarm coffee? <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is. Well, that's that's yeah. not good at all. Yeah. That's the worst. You could extremely cold coffee, pretty good. Uh-huh. Nice hot coffee, also pretty good. Lukewarm, not so much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kishore Hari, how are you doing? I'm doing great. We're the Hoodie Brigade because it is cold in San Francisco. Yeah. It's it get dark earlier now that daylight savings has passed. I'm yes. loving that, dude. What? Seriously, no, seriously. You're like I, the only person that thinks daylight I, savings is good. It's, I don't care about how much daylight there is. I care about the sleep I get because I go to sleep. I now feel sleepy early enough so I can go to sleep at a reasonable hour. And then I get all that nice extra sleep in the morning. What a luxury. It's wonderful. To go to sleep when you feel sleepy. Yes. <laughs> it's no problem. Like a lot of us are night owls, you know, in the tech community. Yep. Myself among them. And I try to go to sleep early, but it's hard. I'm a normal human adult that falls asleep while typing emails. Whoa. No, right? Well, that's wait, that's uh, the state of in, things In now. bed with laptop or phone? A little of both. I hate the phone. Fo- I, I can't do the phone, typing the phones, because it falls. I, w- once my hands get tired... It falls and that wakes me up again. It's well, the endless cycle. Don't buy a thousand dollar phone then that just sh- shatters upon impact. Oh, well, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll, we'll get to that. That's just some sick burns over there from the Android Brigade. Yeah, it is. Uh, but uh, man, I, we're like a week and a half removed from the live show, and it's still it feels fresh in my mind. It's still got the live show highs. Uh, really? Yeah. It feels like a year ago. Well, at that's this because point. you've been doing events every single night multiple yeah. for uh for the bay area science festival well, that runs for another couple days yep it runs through saturday when we have our finale at at&t park wow. where about thirty thousand people are coming for hands-on science day oh god are you guys afraid of rain potential rain no i looked at the long range weather forecast it's gonna rain thursday okay and not again till sunday oh great right. but can i tell you the thing i'm most excited about that's happening this weekend what's happening this so weekend? San Francisco has a professional soccer team called the Deltas now, and they play at Kizar Stadium, which is like two blocks from my house. Yes. And uh, we went to a game. That's where high school players play. Yeah, yeah. It's totally like a high school stadium. And we went to a game, and it was so much fun. There was like a band playing. There was, you know, it was really family friendly. Uh, It was cheap. Like tickets were like five bucks. Totally enjoyable. Mm hmm. Deltas made the playoffs. We went to the semifinals on Sunday night. We won. We're hosting the finals this Sunday at Kizar Stadium. The Deltas? This is great news. San Francisco Deltas. Oh, also, it came out that they're almost bankrupt and probably will fold. <laughs> oh, so this no. may be their last game. <laughs> Sports teams who are do they, business. Who do they play? Other cities in California? Or? Uh, they're playing the New York City Cosmos. That's a national thing. Oh, yeah. It's a it's a 10-team league Holy cow. with cities from Canada through the U.S. Jeez. All right. Way to go, Deltas. Oh, wow. Okay. You guys do anything fun over the weekend? Any any activities over the weekend? Well, it wasn't Halloween, was it? No, that was, no, last, that was last week. Yeah. Time, time goes by fast. Nothing. I got nothing. 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 Wow. I, I mean, I went I went to a soccer game. I went to a bunch of science festival events because yeah. that's what, what's going on for me. But it was also my birthday this week. Oh, happy, happy birthday. Thanks for, sure. for everyone that wished me a happy birthday. Yeah, the, the no big, thanks the big to the 
No, yeah. <laughs> no thanks to the whoever is running the tested Facebook feed was outing me for my weird science channel outing. Really? Did you not see that? Oh, I was on Science you Channel over this week. I was very excited about a rope. <laughs> <laughs> very, like too excited about a rope. I was on a show called Strange Evidence. I think it was called, which was basically like closed this is archival. Yeah, you know, it was. Uh, it's like the um, the CCTV feeds, and it's like I don't understand what happened. Can somebody try to explain this? And uh, I was on that show. It was good. it was fun. It was totally fun to be on. Mm-hmm. But the clip they have me on is being like. How did these cars just come to a full stop across this road? And it's literally there's like this metal rope coming across the road. Wow. <laughs> I went to the uh, Alameda flea market oh, on, wow. on Sunday. First I've Sunday always, every month. That's a big deal. It's a massive flea market. You can pay early to get in. You, I, or which is like, pay extra to get in early. So like early. What do you think is early I for think a flea market? Like crack of dawn. Yeah. Yeah. So like normal price for starting at five bucks for a nine o'clock entry. That's fine. I, I'm not going to make nine o'clock entry on a Sunday morning. No. In Alameda. Uh, but people go really crack it on and yeah. pay twenty bucks to buy things, That's and it's a massive flea market. It's the place. It's the it's the um, uh, the the place where MythBusters used to shoot. Mm-hmm. So literally uh, in the Alameda, um, the docks, I guess you would call them. This big. I don't. It's not an airfield, but it's like just that giant, runway. Thing. It's a runway. That's what yeah. it is. And it's just, <laughs> Sounds and like an airfield, off, but it looks. It's packed. It looks like a big bazaar, and you can. Spend hours and hours there. Did Bazaar. You, did you, <laughs> that's like the elephant. Like yes. how do you pronounce it? Babar. Yes. Uh, so, did you buy anything? Um, Danica bought a bunch of stuff. We we collect two things. We collect vintage nineteen seventies PepsiCo DC Comics glasses. Mm. Vintage glasses. Wow. Like the kinds they sold at gas stations. Yes, Danica has a huge collection of those, and she's eagle eyed. She knows, like for example, like. <laughs> Shazam, no one wants Shazam. You try to sell me Shazam for 20 bucks, you're probably 16 bucks too much. Because they're, comp- com- I think the flea market experience is different now because of eBay. Thankfully, yeah. there is no reception whatsoever in the flea market. Reception? What do you mean? There's like no, no seller reception. reception. So you can't oh, so check people, prices. People aren't going to be on eBay or, or whatever looking at stuff. I thought you meant like shrimp and tartar sauce and like drinks. Oh, no, like, no. like <laughs> they have food trucks <laughs> out there. Food trucks. They, the, the entire flea market is flanked by food trucks, so you can have your kettle corn. You can walk around. It's, like, it's great. It's taking pictures of things there. Like if you're not going to buy stuff, a lot of cool furniture, um, a lot of like weird tin toys, yeah. old signage. Uh, we picked up a paint by numbers, other thing that um, we collect, and we got some really good deals on some paint by numbers. Will you be going back? Uh, I, it's my third time there. Oh, you've gone back. I've gone. This is my th- our third time there. A secret life. I've yeah. never gone. I'm so, I'm so interested in going. Yeah. Uh, but I ha- I'm curious what load in looks like for that. Yeah. Like yeah. it must be like building a small city. It is because it's, the cars like are there. They can't run the cars. They can't run power. Uh, but it's rows and rows of people with carpets rolled out, tables set up, all their wares. Um, and, and then they have a very efficient system of the trucks coming in from the sides to load things for that people will buy. If you do buy furniture, not everything. It's not a. It's not like going into an antique store and finding like the rare thing that the owner didn't know. Yeah. Like, what is this, a salt shaker? No, it's a Curta calculator. Like, I'll pay you five bucks for it. It's not that because everyone there knows the value of their things. It's about finding a thing that you can't, otherwise hmm. don't want to wait for shipping for or you can haggle or you just like see it in person and discover that thing exists. Um, so it's great for discovery. Is there classic computer games and technology like computers there? Uh, Sean, we went with Sean Charlesworth, and he said he saw uh, this classic robot, but it was, was way overpriced. Okay. Um, no classic computer games. Right. There were Xbox games. Xbox no, One, no, I guess no. it's vintage. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, like like uh, arcade games, that kind of thing. I s- did see like old like uh, Plinko machines oh, and okay. yeah, like stuff like that. Uh, no, no pinball. Um, like it's more. It, it does feel like antique store stuff. The stuff you would put on the counter, stuff you put in the kitchen, uh, you know, lots of interesting heat teacups and, and cookware. The thing that I, I love, and we got one of these last time we went, but uh, I always love looking at them, are the um, the Hamilton drawers. So they're uh, typesetter, typesetters. So yeah. uh, typesetter drawers, uh, which can be repurposed as display cases. So you hang them up on your wall, and they hold what previously they would be holding, uh, like letterpress, um, 
and now they would you can put like little trinkets and, and things in them. When Mark Dubo was in the office a while ago, he said the the VK machine from the original Blade Runner actually has a typesetter drawer in it. Oh, all I right, did not know that. I'm okay. bored. All right, <laughs> let's talk about some pop culture news. Now I want to do Antiques Roadshow <laughs> Tested Edition. <laughs> Bring your stuff in, and I will, I will evaluate it. I'd love that, actually. That'd be fun. You have to do it exactly in the same style. We get like no, St- it, Steve Lynn to, to yeah. uh, appraise all the old video games. Oh, it would just be Jeremy being mad, be like, "How can this not be appraised for a million dollars?" This game. <laughs> so yeah. it's like the it's like the viewer side, the camera on on the viewer in front of the TV. Yeah, that he's so wrong about that thing. Uh, did you guys watch Thor this weekend? Not yet. Oh. I, I did watch Thor. Okay. Um, I watched Thor as well. I watched the first one. Oh, okay. That's all right. All right. Okay. That's, 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 that's okay. That's, that's, that's something there. so condescending. All right. Well, because uh, this is clearly the best of the Thor films. It is. And I think it builds on what was great about the first one, uh, what people liked about the first one, the fish out of water, the comedy. Uh, it really r- leans into that. Huh. Uh, did you enjoy the first Thor? I did. I was shocked by just when I saw who the director was. Oh, Kenneth Branagh. Kenneth Branagh. What? Yeah. That's awesome. Well, the, the, when that was first, uh, some context, when they first announced Thor, Thor was a risky character. Just like Iron Man was a risky character for Marvel. Thor, I believe, was the second Marvel film. I could be very wrong about this. I believe it was Iron Man, Thor, then Captain America, first Avenger. No, Thor was right before Avengers, I think. No. Because Thor 2 came out before Avengers. I don't no, know. No, 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 that's nope. not right. Yeah, At the was... very end of Thor, like the post credit sequence, it's yeah. Loki eyeing the, uh, the yeah, Tesseract. You're, no, you're right, you're right. It's, it was, uh, I'm sorry, man. it was um, Iron Man, Captain America, then Thor, then we had the event, uh, and the, of course, Hulk was universal. I did like it, and I liked all the fish out of water stuff that you yes. mentioned. In the, yeah. Like, that Thor was a newer character. Right. It all felt fresh. But Kenneth Branagh, who had, you know, directed Hamlet and many Shakespearean uh, theatrical movies, uh, uh he seemed like a perfect fit, huh. and he was a great fit for Thor One because of the his portrayal of Asgard. I think he really set the tone <laughs> of creating what it would be like. It's not Game of Thrones, but it's like what it would be like for a species of aliens to be gods and have on to live on this this planet of their own. And slightly arrogant Thor is kind of fun, yeah. and we got a yeah. little bit of return of that. Yes, yes, that's, which is great yeah. because we got kind of morose sad thor in the second movie yeah moody thor <laughs> yeah and speaking of game of thrones second thor was directed by a game of thrones director um so the second one was really dark you know dark elves it was very like the earth is in peril third one none of that what i loved about it it wasn't about the earth being in peril or any planet being it was just like a survival story well, hmm. asgard was in peril Sure, but it, it, it's not something that the viewer you relate to. Like, okay, the, the planet, London is in peril, San Francisco. No, it's it's like Thor and his own adventure. Wait, so my only criticism of that movie, uh, or my main criticism of the movie, is that it almost was tried to be too comedic. Like, because there would be just these punch down lines that would just appear in the height of some of the climactic battles. What, what's wrong with that? I guess not it's a comic nothing. It's film. Yeah, it, it sounds like Guardians of the Galaxy. That, I think yes, really, that's what it was. Totally, totally. They they said Guardians had a lot. They, people love Guardians. They love that, but visually, not like it was distinct. It hmm. did not look like Guardians. It had a almost Jack Kirby esque color tone to it. Um, so it was very New Gods, uh, and Chef Goldblum was great in it. I don't. I, there's a little bit of controversy, and we'll talk about all the controversies surrounding Thor. Not going to plot details, but one of the controversies is that people are unhappy somewhat that the big second act reveal was like in the first teaser trailer, and that oh, the, the, <laughs> like the character reveal, the character character reveal, yeah, and like I don't know how you get away from that because that was such a big part. You of, mean the Hulk? Th- thanks, Jeremy. It's I was trying, the, I was, it's it, no, everyone's seen it. I mean, people have referred to this as a buddy cop film. We, right. Yeah, so, right. like, but like the film doesn't play it as everyone knows. Oh, I thought that was first seen. No, the no. film plays it as like, oh, Thor's not going to know. This is going to the audience is going to love this. But like, and yes, huh. the, the moment is is awesome. Well, the reveal still has a great impact, but one hundred percent lessened because it was just 
the part I, of the marketing campaign. I think they had to do it as part of the marketing campaign because well, to everyone, make all the monies. Yeah, to make all the money. <laughs> Though I, I will still, there was still a cameo that was amazing mm. in this movie. I'm trying to think of what all you're right. talking about. Are you talking the, about think a, of the play. Oh yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Did you see any Infinity Stones? I ah. shall not discuss this. Wow. I, I'm, I'm, okay. So is this a? We're not going to go. It's not a full spoiler cast, but there is a scene not well related to the the plot of the film that acknowledges a, uh, an Easter egg in Hulk in, in Thor oh, yeah. one. Yeah. And, walking through the. Huh. Yeah. yeah. So in in, uh, in Thor one. I'm sorry. Thor one. Um, Odin has his chamber of, of, um, of trophies. Yeah. Right. And that's where. Uh, that that's where what's <coughs> the, the ice giants they break in and they break they in stuff. but it's, it's where the tesseract is held it's the where the cask um, of ancient winters right, is there the eternal flame mm-hmm. um, and what's the villain or uh, in um, the big uh, sentry guy the guardian destroyer uh, destroyers yes yes destroyers oh with it. the fire vision yes yeah. yes and then and the great body armor um, so that's like Odin's chamber and in Thor 1 we get a fleeting glimpse of Thanos's gauntlet the infinity gauntlet you're kidding it is literally it's like with in gems, the background too. with gems it's in the background people freaked out because this is before <laughs> uh avengers one yeah and like odin has infinity gauntlet there's gonna be a huge plot point in the in the avengers film it's gonna be like that's where it is we know where it is now it, the prop showed up at comic-con that exact prop was brought out for minutes at comic-con rolled out literally unveiled then unveiled and, and rolled away um and obviously that's not the Infinity Gauntlet, because at the stinger at the end of, I believe, um, Ultron, right? Or no, 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 no. Guardians, Guardians, yeah, Where Guardians he... two, um, no, Thanos, Gu- Guardians one, where Thanos goes, my, fine, my, I'll do it myself, I'll do it myself. That's right, mm-hmm. and he, 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 yeah, he has the gauntlet. He puts on the gauntlet, right? So he has a gauntlet. So they acknowledge hmm. that there are. Th- Two gauntlets. In oh, that that's not universe. a mistake, or like it. No, they they, t- they played up for comedy. Interesting. Yeah, it's a great scene. Uh, quick question about Thor one: Does the Natalie Portman uh, storyline continue in Thor two? They, it does continue. It makes it, it is a important part. It may, maybe is like the only story in in Thor two. Oh, okay. Because it was gone in Avengers. Like that surprised me that they well, had that Avengers, whole arc happening and then nothing. In Avengers, they they mention her. Do they? Yeah. Yeah. So in Avengers she, one. But they mention her in both Avengers, actually. In Avengers One, Coulson goes when they when Thor is on the helicarrier for the first time. They're coming together. Coulson, uh, Agent Coulson goes uh, to Ori. We found um, Doctor. I forget her her name. The character, uh, Jane Jane Foster. Doctor Foster. We've uh, secluded her away um, because Selvik has been mind changed. Like wow. she's been she's been she's in a secure location. Thor, you don't have to worry about her. So they threw that in for the fans. They threw that in for the fans because they cool. didn't want to cast her over in my the film. And then in Avengers Two. Uh, in the party scene in Avengers Tower, uh, they do. Uh, uh, I think, is it Iron Man? Yeah, I, I think it's it's Iron Man and Thor have like a whose whose girlfriend is better. Hmm. Or Thor goes like Jane's better. Jane's a Jane's a natural physicist and and has won many prizes, many awards. There, there's a nod in this film too. So, okay. I I will say I was surprised uh, to your question about Infinity Stones. I was surprised at what. Did or did not happen in this movie? Because you were convinced. I was a hundred percent convinced, and I was wrong. Oh. <laughs> Some, it's okay to be wrong sometimes. That's what life is a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what that means? That means I'm camping out for Black Panther. Wow. Yeah. No. The Black Panther looks amazing. Uh, I will also say I watched it in Dolby Cinema, and um, totally worth it. One hundred really? sold in Dolby Cinema now. Uh, the experience Dolby Cinema this time wasn't as Earth shattering as Blade Runner and Dolby Cinema, but yeah. I love that screen. I love that sound. I love yeah. the reclining seats. I think it's just as good as, if not better, than IMAX for a film that's not actually shot in eighty millimeter IMAX. Uh, and I closed my ears during the Force Awakens sh- or uh, the Last Jedi trailer. Oh wow! I I I did. You closed the, I, your ears. I did the Joey. Did, did the full Joey Famelli. <laughs> Eyes closed. La la la. <laughs> <laughs> All Maybe the people you, sitting around you were pissed off. I buried my head in, in, in Danica's shoulder. Okay. I'm sure in a couple years, they're going to come up with a way of like, if you do not want to see this trailer. Right. There'll be like sensory deprivation. No, they want goggles. you to see the trailers. 
They're there. The trailers are the. It'll be fine. Yeah. They've already sold the ticket. I know. They've already sold the ticket. Um, but yeah, I some guess. other controversy with Thor. The movie made a ton of money, like 122 million or something, in opening weekend, exceeding all expectations. But and the reviews were glowing. You know, I think at one point on Rotten Tomatoes, the highest, the most well-reviewed Marvel movie, mm-hmm. um, not only of the year, I think of all Marvel movies at 94. percent It's a little but lower now. Not all could review it. Not everyone could review it. You would think that a publication as prestigious and established as as Los Angeles Times would be among the early reviewers. And they have apparently, as of uh, last week, they were blackballed from reviewing Marvel films. They did not get access to early screenings, partly because they had been reporting on Disney's relationships with Anaheim yeah. and some potential, not for us to say, shady business practices. It was... Uh, it was a really long form story on the link between Disney and Anaheim politicians Wasn't around kind of, a parking garage. It was an ongoing story, right? Like yeah. They kept reporting on it. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a lengthy story about just sort of give backs this, the city has made concessions to Disney um, around, you know, certain public land. And so what wasn't clear to me from the story was the L.A. Times thinks that's why they got punished by this. But was it ever overtly clear that 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 disney said because you are doing this they just banned them without a reason right 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 so people uh, just assume it's because of that story yeah is that yeah. a do you think it's a wrong assumption no i don't think it's a wrong assumption but i'm just you know okay. trying to be clear about this yeah about what we know okay and other outlets uh had then come out and join the la times in solidarity and talk about not reviewing marvel films until the ban was lifted, and it worked. The yep. ban is now lifted. Part- like particularly some writers groups and awards groups, they mm-hmm. said we will not be awarding Disney any awards this year for any films. Wow! Unless this ban is lifted. That's great. Yeah. Don't let the studios bully you. As a journalist, like f- freedom of the press is important, especially th- this year where there's so much animosity towards the press. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, of, of course, it is a studio's prerogative to allow. Any reviewer, it, de- it wants to to review any product or any any company, right? Early reviews, like there's nothing stopping LA Times from going day one, you know, going to a midnight showing and writing a review. Uh, but it's about the early access and when it's all about, you know, f- the, the hunt for these eyeballs and and, and servicing the reader. You want to give the be- the best, most fairest and um, review you can. Um, so I'm glad that's that's something that the the press won out on. In other industries, that may not have been the case. Um, you know, there's been some notable blackballing in um, in, uh, in the games industry, for example. Um, Suspicion of that happening in the NFL right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then some other controversy with uh, Walt Disney Studios. We're sorry to pile on. <laughs> this is just making the news. That's funny. Uh, of course, Disney owns Lucasfilm, which is releasing The Last Jedi this December. And their relationships, not only with the press, but also with the theater groups themselves, the very venues which will be making them all the monies in December, um, is strained because some reports say Disney has given these theater owners and theater groups like AMC, Regal, whatever, Century, um, new terms. Yeah, so what's the deal? I I only read the headlines on this because it it seems kind of... You know, I'm going to see the movie. I don't. I don't need to know the inside baseball on this. But, but they, they were requiring a larger take from the theaters. Yes. Is that the deal? So it's all business, right? So I, I didn't realize this myself. I thought it was a very standard practice that there was a industry wide standard of the cut, just like you would uh, have for App Store for something, right? Like theaters take, theaters make most of their money from concessions and from um, upselling seats, yeah. right? And and other other value adds, arcades or whatever, and most of the gross ticket sales goes to the studio um and i didn't realize there was even much of a cut at all yeah it seems that at least for star wars the cut is as previously was as high as 64 percent went to the studios the rest 36 percent went to the theater chain and the new terms is has boosted up to apparently according to some reports 65 percent which one percent of a billion dollars yeah. is it's a lot you know, of money. Ten million dollars spread spread evenly from theater chains, but it's more about um, forcing. If you if you're a theater, you want to screen the Last Jedi. The Last Jedi has to be in your best screen for a month. The that's, month part. That is me. what I think the theater owners had issue with. 
because if if your your asset as a theater owner is your screens, right? That the number of screens, the quality of screens. If you have an IMAX screen, a Dolby Cinema screen, the highest value ticket is in that screen, and typically. It's the first two weeks that's most important, and uh, it should be your prerogative if a movie's doing well to keep that movie playing because everyone benefits. But to force a movie to say contractually this has to be on your best screen with the highest ticket sales that you can't make any other – you can't – you know any yeah, other yeah. big release, that's a big deal. I, I, I think it's be- – uh, the, the place that bothers me is is not the, the multiplexes because they can – they have enough screens to make this work. It's the art – art house smaller places that maybe they want to screen some of the Oscar films that are coming out at the end of December. And this would kind of put that a block on some of that. I feel like there's a very clear symbiotic relationship between the studios and the theaters that this disrespects. You know, it's mm. in everyone's interest to have the best best selling movie in the best screen. The theater owners are going to want to do that as long as it makes sense. Right, right. Once there aren't, there isn't the audience and it doesn't make sense and they need a smaller theater, they should be able to do that. Totally. And the, according to the reports, the contract contractual terms indicated that if the theater was to violate and take Star Wars off of their best screen, you know, the third week or early in the fourth week, their cut to Disney for that run would get bumped to 70% hmm. as a penalty. And yeah. I, I, I can understand theaters just not wanting to stomach that. And so that's what some, some theaters did. And they said they are not going to be uh, playing The Last Jedi, which sucks for everyone. I mean, can you believe it? Can you believe that it wouldn't make financial sense for theaters to show it? Wow. I mean, but that's what it came to. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I don't know exactly how the politics work because, for example, in, in most major cities, they're, in downtown areas, you have a ton of theaters, right? But there are different chains. And sometimes yeah. it feels like certain chains get some movies and certain chains don't get, they don't compete. They like, they don't have AMC and century that are across the street from each other. They both, they don't both have the Batman film. So one has the Batman film, one has the star Wars film or something. Um, hmm. So I don't know exactly how it works. Uh, apparently the, the typical cut is about 50 to 60% of the gross goes back to the studio uh, from ticket sales, um, which totally deserving of, you know, it's their film. They made the movie. Um, but it's it's not easy to run a theater as a business. Yeah. Um, speaking of uh, more movie news, uh, you know, Justice League comes out in like a week and a half. Is that true? Yeah. Just, yeah. I Remember? couldn't be less excited about that movie, what? right? Is this, this is the one where Aquaman rides on the front of the Batmobile and jumps yes. off? Yes. Yeah. All right. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just like oh. every, every commercial I see for it, every trailer makes me less excited because oh. it's just all like frenetic movement yeah. no story yeah you don't think the rest of the film is story <laughs> what they're not showing that's taking a, a real bet <laughs> did you see the, the the gif of uh gal gadot using the wonder woman instagram filter no. or uh or uh what is the thing? snapchat snapchat the yeah filter? snapchat no it's great I mean, oh. <laughs> it gives right. her the shield and the, the tiara and it makes her wonder woman it, oh that's interesting she smiles it's great that's great yeah, yeah. She's pretty smiling I, I like the like the actors having fun with their roles um james corden did a really fun bit with uh thor all the cast members of thor did a fake stage play of thor ragnarok um oh. uh, for for a surprising to surprise an audience who thought they were going to a screening it was it was a gag that's it was, amazing it was, it's got a 10 minute video actually uh totally worth watching anyway um this this year, oh my gosh, yeah, this year we had the Mummy reboot, which is supposed to be Universal Studios' oh. uh, first film in their shared cinematic universe called the Dark Universe. Oh, poor guys. Yeah, and uh, it was the Mummy. It was gonna be all their monsters, right? So um, the Mummy, I guess Wolfman. Um, who else? Uh, Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde was gonna be one. Hmm. Um, they had already cast a bunch of characters: you know, Tom Cruise, Russell Crowe, all these big name actors, Johnny Depp, everyone, Invisible Man, all these people involved. Now it's going to be put on hold. So no, because no. people saw the mummy and was like, "This is terrible." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think it's more a point of like you can't force a cinematic universe to happen. You can't make that the business plan and and um, and, and jump right in. You got to build, make good movies first. So it gives me a little bit of fear because there's also like the Godzilla shared universe, and I like both the first Godzilla film, the reboot, um, and also uh, Kong Skull Island. And there's another one. So that, that shared universe makes more sense than a monster universe with that we don't associate those characters as being linked. Yeah, yeah, no, totally true. Um, I, I mean, 
movie studios are they want IP, right? Like one of the, that's one of the reasons people enviously call Disney the IP factory because they owned so much. Yeah. Um, and they they did the they made the right business decisions in terms of buying up Lucasfilm, you know, Pi- Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Pixar. and buying up Pixar and buying up Marvel. Uh, Marvel Comics, and there was a, a business deal reported earlier this week that is unconfirmed and um, apparently it's not an active discussion. But Disney was in talks to potentially buy up 20th Century Fox Studios. Oh, yeah, not the TV stuff. So we're not talking about Simpsons. We're not talking about um, uh, X Files. But, uh, not talking about 24. That all or American Idol. But we're talking about the Fox film franchises, which include. All of the mutants, all of the roster of uh, Fantastic Four, mutants, Deadpool, um, and bring of course, that all back into the X-Men. Disney family and the X Men, mm-hmm. uh, and also Aliens, Predator, like mm. all these characters. Oh, yeah. Imagine that in Disney, in the, in the Disney family. It's tough for me to imagine because, like, I couldn't. If Disney owned Deadpool, we would not have the same Deadpool. No, movie. we would not have gotten that Deadpool. That's yeah. true. We might have gotten Ryan Reynolds, but not that right, right. That kind of crazy Deadpool. So I'm both in favor of this and against it. Like I'm in favor of the idea of a cohesive Marvel universe, uh, just because like there's no reason for those characters not to uh, overlap. But at some point, like this is like all the telecoms merging together. Like yeah. we're losing some story credibility and and interesting stuff that could potentially happen. Yeah. And I get that Fox has made some terrible movies with yep. these characters recently with the exception of Deadpool. Uh, but I still don't, I don't want a Disney fied universe where it, it's Kevin Feige running everything. Yeah. I mean, I think it makes what, what they did with Sony made a lot of sense with Spider-Man, you mm-hmm. know, work out a business deal to cross pollinate and to give some of the Disney magic, some of that Marvel studios magic and direction um, to influence some of the films that could use help uh, like fantastic four uh, those franchises, but I don't think they need to own everything or to be have their fingers in everything. Uh, but new IPs are um, are are rare and they're coveted, and it's one of the reasons Netflix found an exclusive relationship with comic book creator Mark Miller and Miller World. And Netflix next year, born out of this relationship, will be releasing its very first comic book series. Netflix publishing a comic book. Oh, like a physical comic. A book? physical comic book. Yeah. Isn't oh, that weird? I don't get it. Yeah. <clears throat> There's so, a tie-in with a show, I assume. No, I, maybe I think maybe the idea is to use it as an IP um, testing ground so you can get people like oh. at Comic-Con excited. People, definitely, there are a lot of fans of Mark Miller's work. This comic book series is called The Magic Order, and it's about magicians who live among us. So, grown-up Harry Potter? I don't know. Mark Miller will have some twist to it. But they could have turned it into a film. I mean, this is Netflix owns it completely. Yeah. And it's very low cost for them to hire someone to do something that they've been doing well and already would have been doing, yeah, probably right. writing comics, and not have to invest hundreds of millions of, into buying a franchise, buying a property, and then making a film out of it. If this does well, they'll make a film out of it. I'm sure they're developing other those comic book properties in the films or TV shows already. Hmm. Um, other big thing in comic news, comic book fans know the name Brian Michael Bendis. BMB, as people know him as. He Miles is, Morales forever. He is not only uh, the creator of Jessica Jones, okay. but the creator of the new Spider-Man, Ultimate Spider-Man, Miles Morales. He was the writer of Ultimate Spider-Man for the, its almost its entire duration. Super successful, especially with kids. Yes, yeah, incredible writer. Uh, he's done a ton of work. He, but he previously had been exclusive as a Marvel comics writer and had done so much for the Marvel brand. He wrote... I, so much of the big events, the crossover events, the mega events. And this week, shockingly, mm. he is has signed an exclusive contract with the other side, with DC. DC Comics. It's This is big deal in comics world. Uh, what does it mean? Well, he'll be probably <laughs> writing some Batman. Jeremy's making a face. I'm, I'm looking to see how big a deal it is. It is a big deal. It's a big deal. Because... Uh, because I think it's mostly because of Ultimate Spider-Man, how successful that series is. This uh, Does this mean that he's going to get a chance to take a character, a beloved character, and reboot that character in the same vein? Is there going to be a new imprint? Jeff Johns over on the DC Comics side had t- been that role, writing all the literal rebirth characters with Green Lantern and, and Superman. Um, but I would hope that 
DC wants him to create new characters. Oh, um, or new spins on characters. Because what Marvel has done very successfully over the past couple of years is take familiar names like Captain America, like Captain Marvel, and given and even Iron Man, and given them to new characters. So they don't be named new heroes. I know it's tough to create a new type of superhero or a new name that's going to resonate. But have the characters grow old, have them evolve, and have a new generation take on the mantles. Hmm. And I would hope that that's what BMB can do for DC. Hey, uh, either of you follow BlizzCon news? Well, I follow a little bit just because I played World of Warcraft for a good year of my life. And uh, I was curious. I like the company. It's a good games company. I mean, they do good stuff. They really are one of the best at what they do. They and, are absolutely one of the best at what they do. And, and, and how many games companies have, have their own con? Like, that's, a, that's pretty cool. You don't, you don't see Call of Duty Con. <laughs> no Tony Hawk Con. Oh, you don't God. See, uh, Call of Duty Con would be rough. The Sims Con. No, you don't. No. You don't see any of that. Yeah, and BlizzCon, it's, it's like, they're like the Pixar of video game companies. Uh, Everything they make explodes that's right. magic. They, take, they have very little fa- few fa- failures. Unlike Pixar, though, like they're not be, they're not beholden to their schedule in the same kind of way. Like Pixar no. has to meet their release yeah. dates, but yeah. these guys take they're like on valve time. Like they, right, right. They take it until they they're well, done. Well, because everything they put out seems to be a hit. Yeah, and uh, incredibly. And then yeah. like they were make, working on this MMO for half a decade, and then they said, yeah, it's not working out. We're we're not going to make that anymore. And then everyone moved over to Overwatch, mm-hmm. and they made one of the best team shooters ever. So. This uh, BlizzCon was the biggest ever, and they had these different arenas for every major property that the company has, which are like huge rooms. Yeah, I went last year, and oh, it's, you it's, went? Last yeah, year? I went last year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Anaheim Convention Center, and literally every you you take like the biggest land party you've ever seen and <laughs> multiply that Dude. by five. Yeah, because it's crazy. for every game is that area, land set up, tournament set up, giant stadium sized competition arenas set up um, for so it's Overwatch, par- for StarCraft. Yeah. So it's part LAN party, part Comic-Con? Well, it's, co- part, co- it's part cosplay yeah, meetup, part um, and, and part co- uh, LAN competition. It, so it's, it's also like part like big event. I mean, it's like yeah, yeah. it's where you get all the announcements for the year. Right. So what so were the, the announcements? The big announcements, well, the big one for me personally is probably they're bringing back World of Warcraft vanilla. What like does that mean? Classic. The first version. Before there was the craziness that destroyed everything and opened a rift and everything went crazy. Uh, and all the expansions. So there is a new expansion, though. There's a seventh oh, that's expansion. Separate. That's separate. So, yeah, there's a, yeah, of course there's another expansion. We're going, we're going back to Leroy Jenkins. Style. But a lot of people have been saying, you know, look, that is a part of something that I really liked. Mm. And it's gone. Can I please go back to that world? What, are you, what can you do in that world? Well, like Stormwind and is like not destroyed, and the world is as you remember it when you first played World of Warcraft. Is this going to be like one of those Warcraft shared universes? Like this is a time travel thing, and what you do in this vanilla universe will somehow bleed into that's weird. And and like I mean, it's the, an opportunity to create some story out of it. They did say it's a much harder challenge than we think, and so they're tr- then they want to make it the game you feel you remember, not the actual experience. Mm. So they're they're doing they're working on it. No ETA. But they are bringing that back. I think that's great because I will probably try that. <laughs> wow! I mean, I can't commit to signing up again because that's that's a real commitment. That is a real know. commitment. Uh, there's an awesome looking um, uh, map, map coming out for Overwatch, which is theme world based. Mm-hmm. Yes. What theme, does that uh, mean? Theme oh, park. Theme park. Theme park. Theme park sorry, based. sorry. It's Blizzard World theme park based. It's You're- basically a Blizzard theme park. You're bearing in the this lead. Is, this is some weird like meta stuff. Yeah. Like. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it'll be fun, but like people are already playing a Blizzard game. They want to be like now in their face. The name of the company who made the game oh, it's got, is like, the world. Then there's a Murloc above the entrance. It's like not even Overwatch. It's is just this like they, it's they, they, Blizzard. Like, well, we're gonna do a theme park one day. Might as well do, get people excited about that idea. Yeah, ten yeah. out of ten, I would go to real Blizzard World. Oh my goodness. So they they're yeah, okay. You yeah, go yeah. into a they they did like you know camera fly throughs of the world and everything of the yeah. the actual map. The map. You go into this tavern and there's the classic blizzard games like that on little arcade games like, nice it's, but, but it's this super is cool. a combat map i know i know, like, I know. Yeah, it's fine wars? like <laughs> it's, it's fine it's blizzard man it's awesome I, the, i'm super happy about the it. next thing is what i was most excited oh, about thing? you're happy about what starcraft i still play starcraft 2 going you, free to play Starcraft 2 free to play multiplayer of course yeah mm-hmm. uh, all the single player expansions i didn't know you played 15 bucks game. each mm-hmm. uh, i played for a long time the game is old now it's like it's, it's like not that old six years old yeah 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 yeah, that's okay. That's, I don't know. So it, it makes sense. 
it, it it makes sense for StarCraft two because it still has a pretty big community of people that play online. I like if you look on Twitch, I think it's still in like the top ten games that are streamed. What are the microtransactions that will help this game survive? I I don't know. That's a good question. Okay. Uh, yeah. That that's it. You know, then there's like expansions for Hearthstone and uh, I don't know. Heroes of the Storm. Yeah, the, here the, Hanzo is coming. Heroes of the Storm, but uh, cross pollination, shared Blizzard yeah. universe looks cool. Do you see? There are a couple friends have tested up at BlizzCon. Yes, yes. Uh, Bill Duran, Punish Props. Uh, BlizzCon is one of the big conventions he goes to, and he unveiled a. Uh, a full, it's not a costume, but a. RC prop, human sized RC prop of a probe droid from StarCraft 2. Probius. Yeah. It would look it looked gorgeous. Huh. It was awesome. I had friends that were at BlizzCon that were posing for photos with Probius. I'm like, hey, that's Bill's thing. Yeah. It looked great. And it moved around pretty pretty decently at a at a decent probe like rate. Yeah, yeah. I Very think cool. Frank brought his um Murlocs. Murlocs. Yes, up there. yes. They were yeah. dressed up again. Murlocs in cosplay. So Very cool. Um I think that does it for some pop culture news. Let's oh, talk about really okay. some tech news. I know what you did last Friday, Jeremy Williams. <gasps> you uh, you shook hands. You did the secret handshake with your UPS guy. I did. and. <laughs> It received I your and then iPhone you, 10. And then you took your headphones and you put them in the trash. I put a little headstone above them. <laughs> 3D printed headstone yeah. above them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, I got an iPhone 10. I did. I, I broke down and I got the iPhone 10, and I so did you. I did. You, well, let's talk about the iPhone 10. People must know our opinions. The people must know. Uh, no one else has given any opinions <laughs> about this phone yet, so this is going to be very novel. Well... Well, last week we talked about reviewers not having a lot of time with it, so we're all in the kind of even playing field. But the expectations, the fears coming out of the announcement, you know, a month ago, a month and a half ago now, was uh, what justifies uh, what justifies a thousand dollar phone? Yeah. What What does it mean when Apple says this sets the path for the next ten years of iPhone? Is it about the interface? Is it about design? Like what What about this? And obviously, this is a big jump. Um, in past years, we would have thought like this is the kind of update that would have made sense for honestly an iPhone. If the iPhone 8, right? Or if not, iPhone 7, because the 6, 7, and 8 all look similar. So, and to a large extent, the, the 10 looks very similar to the iPhone 6 small design. You, you know, mean in terms well. of like the outer case, the yep. total feel? Yes. Uh, yes, there is a glass back this time. Uh, there's a metal band around the outside. It comes in those two colors. Uh, the screen, right? Is the screen an actual benefit? And does that notch actually hinder the UI experience? Right. Can I hold it? I've actually never held one. Do you have one not in a case? I do. Here we go. Here we go, Kishore. Let me unlock it for you. I had to look at it. <laughs> so, um, better swipe up before it locks. The screen. The, the screen is great. The screen is great. It's, the, it's won some awards for that. Like they did a really nice job on the screen. That's true. Wow. So it's. The, it's a, I don't know the exact um, pixel dimensions of the screen, but mm-hmm. what's important to know about the screen is that it is higher resolution than the previous Plus phones, which were 1080p screens, uh, rendering, but rendering at the same resolution as those phones, I believe. Because um, it's rendering at true 3x, three points per pixel. Okay. And so it's an it's a, a energy multiplier, for what the what the, the images are displaying, and so you're getting extremely sharp text and sh- sharp photos uh, at this high pixel density without any dithering. There's no uh, downscaling. But it is a pentile display. It's their first pentile yes. display. So you take this pixel. That's why the pixel resolution doesn't mean a lot because you can't compare it to, compare it to L- LCD RGB stripe. Yeah. Um, but it is dense enough, and this is the case with like the Samsung Galaxy S8 as well that you cannot see. The pentile arrangement with the naked eye. Yep, you cannot. You can you can scrutinize. You can you can try to like move, look at a white image, like a, a, a white text or a, with a black border around it, and try to like move your eyes left and right because you would no, notice most notice it in any of the aliasing for high contrast images, um, and you can't notice it at all. It it is a gorgeous gorgeous screen that works really well outdoors as well. Oh, so it holds up under sunlight. Holds that up. That's really where I was worried well, about really it. well under sunlight. 
um, it gets bright enough. Um, and having that full screen, like, so I still have my 6S. Uh, I've been switching back and forth between them over the past week just because I need to transfer stuff over. That forehead and chin now seem so dated. I, I can understand that when you're watching media. Like, when you're just using, like, apps on your phone, it doesn't bother me as much. But when you're watching videos, the full the edge-to-edge edge makes a huge difference. It bothers me in Twitter. It bothers me really? in email. It, I cannot stand that f- the forehead and the chin on the old phones now. <laughs> wow. He's um, converted. Yeah, no, I like it, too. I like it, too. And the notch doesn't bother, bother me much at all. So the notch is, is functional, too. I mean, force functional, meaning, like, they had to make some functionality out of the fact that there is they call the the horns or the the ears yeah on the left and right side and so you get less information overall than you previously did with the top bar the top like couple percentage of the screen because you don't see battery percentage indicator um uh, it, yeah that, that type of information right that but type of there's still more screen real estate right, yeah, yeah. yes yes but like in the terms of like what would normally appear on the top bar a notification bar yep um that is split between left and right side very highly deleted now. there's there's now no longer room for a percentage no so if you want right. to see that you have to pull down a little bit yes yep. but pulling down from the notification drawer from the the shade uh from the top right and the top left now perform different functions because because there's no home button the, a lot to, android like they always did that let's talk about that home button yeah, yeah like, th- that's where it's at for me like that yeah. is that's where the compromise is made and i and i use that word intentionally apple released a video that was the first time they've done that in a while which is how to use your new phone right that's the because there most are so many changes non-apple thing to do yeah so i'm gonna i'm gonna play the first couple seconds of that because it, it leads into my only problem with this phone new gestures face id and emoji other pretty cool things that blah, 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 are really blah, blah. easy to use. Here we go. Let's jump right in. New gestures. You've probably noticed that there's no home button. Everyone on board? Yeah. No, sure. I'm with you. This yeah, is sure. true. I, I have noticed, probably noticed. I noticed that. And that's like, It's like every tech review. The first thing you'll notice is there's no home that's button. That's right. And we're all on the same page here. We are. And yes. then she says, That's because we've made it even easier to get around your phone. False. There you go. False. You, so you think you think that's not true? Yes. The reason they, they took away the home button is because they're betting that consumers will prefer more screen real estate over the conveniences that the home button offers. And, and I will also say, and I'm, uh, their market research I know has shown that overseas, China being a huge market, the home button was actually a technical repair liability. <laughs> it, it was something that wore out. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. And I, they had changed that with the, between the 6S and the 7. It was no longer a physical home button. It was just a touch button, Touch ID yeah. being part of it. And Touch ID is is one of the um, one of the byproducts got of that being going away, being replaced with Face ID. But I bet they didn't want to repair home buttons anymore. And so they changed their entire UI. What to, all these things came together, bigger screen, Face ID, well, we're losing the home button. Okay, but that is a compromise, and it is a net gain. I will grant you that. It is a better phone. It, like I will take the bigger screen over the home button. But you think from a, the user experience but perspective? user experience perspective, yes. The button is easier. It, is more, it makes more sense. It's more intuitive. Children who can't speak know how to use the home button. If you teach them that they have to swipe up, there's some granularity you have to teach them. Like, I where do say, you swipe up? I will how say, much do you swipe up? And it's not always the same thing. If you're within an app that is portrait mode, it's okay. Like you swipe up and you get back. If you're within an app that is horizontal, yeah. there is no home bar down there in GarageBand until you try to swipe up. It takes two swipes to get that Gesture thing up. bar, right, right. Yeah. It's more. It's confusing because you don't. You can't get right there. Plus, when you're at, like at the lock screen and you swipe up, you go to your last app rather than to your app like dock, like all, oh, all your screens, apps. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, so things like that really? are, are confusing to people. When I first... Uh, held your phone that's the first thing i tested was was the swipe up how easy that was to get through and i agree with jeremy like mm. the the difference in how much you're swiping up is super non-intuitive yeah i would completely agree that the onboarding time is much less intuitive than a, a button that does everything um but acclimating to the swipe of gesture in portrait mode completely agree about landscape being Yep. messed up i like swiping up to go home more than pressing a button do you do one hand swipe up one hand one hand swipe up i and mean I, i've started to do it try it on my ipad because i'm so used to it yeah. now but i i disagree it is a simpler direct gesture to hit a button 
I feel like it's faster to swipe up. To swipe up, the animation is smoother, and yeah. maybe that's the, the what they've done on the OS level, yeah. and maybe the processor side. But like I. On the success, I want it to, even though it has a home button, I want that gesture there. I want the gesture bar. I also don't like that when to remove apps from your multitasking, you know. They thing. never, they don't want you to do that anymore. Then you, you have to hold down they now. They never have ever wanted you to do that. <laughs> they never wanted you to manage your multitasking. Yeah, you're, you're right. Ne- right. They never, like, it's what everyone says, right? Oh, how do you, well, this app is acting slow. Yeah. Uh, well, go to the multitasking, swipe it up, and move it away. Yeah. Fly it away. So now, like it used to be, you just swipe them up and they go away. And now you, you have to hold down for half a second before you can do that, and yeah. it's just a half a second. But it's like annoying. Because Apple it's slightly never, more annoying. They never closing apps is not a part of their OS design. Their their Touch ID versus FaceTime. I'm totally on face board ID, with Face yeah. or Face ID. I'm totally on board with Face ID. I don't even need Touch ID. I just missed the home button for everything it did until you know. Let's talk about Face ID, ID for a second. Has there been a noticeable shift for you in the fact that now you have to look at your phone to unlock it? Yes. That's like, that's the behavior switch. Yes, yeah. not in using, uh, looking at an app and opening the app, because I'm looking at my phone anyway, mm-hmm. but yes, in Apple Pay or oh. buying apps. Anytime where I want authorization, now it's a look at the phone and then double tap the side button. And that UI interface of like, Hitting that home button or hitting the uh, the the what used to be the power button twice now they have like a a weird on screen indicator like this arrow here yeah, hit yeah. that arrow. that's I think is super stupid. Don't you just use your watch for Apple Pay? No, I hate using the watch for Apple Pay. What? Why? I, you don't I, even I, have to tap anything. I hate it. I, I think I think first of all, watch the, on the the Verifone thing is stupid. Huh. First of all, the fact that you. We're talking about Apple Pay in the context of the watch. I mean, you if you buy the phone, it should work, too. Oh, it does work. But, I mean, if yeah. it's clunky, it, does, it that's not yeah. great. What about in the car? That's where I was always worried about Face ID. Yeah, especially if you're hand, like unlocking it for someone else and you're driving. Yeah. So th- that is the legal. It's all gray area, right? Apple would say that, well, don't use your phone in the car, right? <laughs> <laughs> you should be unlocking your yeah. phone in the car anyway. They'd use that voice, uh, too. <laughs> I know everyone. It's Unfortunately, true. Most people use their phones in their cars for one reason or another. Maybe it's a totally legitimate reason, like unlocking your phone to um, to let someone else use it. That is much more hassle of a hassle because of Face ID. Mm-hmm. Much more of a hassle. Yep. And, and I would say even dangerous mm-hmm. because you, you actually have to pay attention. You have to look at your phone. Precisely. And so hopefully that means people just will stop using the phone in the car or... I, I don't I don't know what the way around it. Like I, Apple kind of knows when you're driving, so maybe they could have a mode where if you're in the driving mode, then you don't like your it stays unlocked longer. Well, actually, it does actually say it gives you a new thing that says I'm not driving, and you have to swipe that. Right, right. Because oh, it's it, recognizing your yeah, speed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you miss fingerprint at all? Touch ID. Mm-hmm. For Apple Pay, yeah, yeah, absolutely. For for things like Apple Pay. And for uh, and for downloading apps, yeah, I don't, I don't, I haven't missed Touch ID. Um, I don't have. That's pretty impressive. It's because it's pretty great. It's actually yeah. fun to have it fill in your password just by looking at you. It that feels very futuristic. It's, it's the first time in a while that I've used the technology on a phone that felt fresh, felt mm. magical. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's more successful. It doesn't. So it's a question, right? It's, it's uh, it is a security mechanism. But it's also this balance between security and convenience, right? Where is that where is that line drawn? Do they want to be overprotective or do they want to be a pain, right? So, like, I have not had any pos- false positives with anyone I've shown my phone to, which, you know, it's not a million people, so I don't know if it's one in a million. Uh, but I definitely have noticed a couple of false negatives where it takes one additional try right. for it to find my face primarily like in the morning you know the first thing i do when i wake up you look turn that off different? my alarm wow and i'm trying it, it it takes the second try i want to see norm in the morning now i mean not in like, person no glasses <laughs> no glasses but like you know i'm a little tired like you know i, I thought I, glasses I, weren't a problem they for weren't it. a problem right but like it's like i'm i'm like i'm sheepish i'm tired yeah. in the morning i want to get to my huh. what my messages are yeah and now i have to like put on a intentional unlocking face <laughs> to get to my phone or this type is, in a password. This is like amazing. Unlocking face is a phrase though. Wow. That's funny. Stephen Levy said the same kind of thing. 
He said that he had to really intentionally look it's at it. It's intentional. You have to be intentional. I don't find that to be the case at all. For me, anyway. Hmm. I wonder if it has anything to do... Like, I wonder if you recalibrated it, if you'd have a different experience. You know what I mean? The whole setup is very easy. Like, they scan your face twice. Yeah. Uh, it's easier than Touch ID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wish it did more than one face that you could recognize, but yeah, I completely understand too. why compounding faces would increase the potential for uh, false positives. Mm. Um, I don't like how heavy it is. It's because it's much heavier than 6S. It is. But given the size, I, 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 I'm I on board. It's not heavier than the, the Plus, though. No, of course not. So no. anyone who previously was on the Plus, this is like everything is, everything is better, right? It's smaller. Smaller, yeah. bigger screen, lighter. You get the cameras. Um, it does not render like the plus in terms of um, the, the points, the, the point, um, the point resolution, uh, point dimensions. So you mean of the screen? Of the screen. Yeah. So if you're on the plus, you actually on a website you see more text along the horizontal uh, uh, lines on, yeah. the, on each column than you would here. This is definitely more like a sharper, slightly bigger version of the the non plus phones. Um, and the last thing. I feel like they copped out on is no um, no Apple Pen, no Apple Pencil. Oh, you wanted that. and I wanted the Apple Pencil. My wife just learned that this exists, and she wants to know why it's not available on the yeah. phone, too. Yeah. If it's a $1,000 phone and it has their best screen, yeah. it has a larger screen with like a, a canvas, why does it ha- have pencil support? Is there some technological hurdle? I bet it's next year. I, I, I bet it's, no, no, I bet it's next year feature. Yeah. Um, they, they needed an S feature. I bet it's an S feature. Take mm. notes. What, I mean, it's a chance for them to sell more accessories. I haven't done any wireless charging yet. Um, I don't have a, a cheap pad, um, and I want I want one of their f- new cheap pads. Um, what do you think of the camera? Because that's yeah. that's supposed to be a big deal. Well, th- that's the other thing. A lot of people who are getting this phone probably, uh, if they came from the non plus phones, this is like a world of change for them. Because like they never wanted a bigger phone, now they have a slightly bigger, slightly heavier phone with a big screen. But now they have two cameras and they have portrait mode. Last year, portrait mode was only for people who wanted to pay for the Plus or for the Jet Black phone, um, the big phone, and that was one of the best features of the Seven. So it, it'll feel new to those people. But anyone who had the Seven Plus, it's the same. It's a nice camera. Okay, portrait mode is nice. The new portrait uh, settings I find are total beta novelty yes like I, i'm not using all anything that like but natural light the black settings like that's like terrible the single light it doesn't terrible. look good and even practice. the contour light i don't like um the look of what contour light does to your face uh the studio light i have preferred that occasionally um but it's the i mean that the portrait mode is essentially unchanged from last year i i can't believe they haven't gotten that to work better i hate those fuzzy edges you don't like you don't like the the way it does hair it just seems like that should have evolved a little better Hmm. it's a good question i think if you look at the the portrait mode so will has a pixel 2 xl and that one has its own version of the portrait mode with single camera it does computational photography as well um and that one actually takes a like there's a delay the photo needs to compute before you can see yeah. the depth setting google's image engineers chose a certain look they chose to really accentuate the hairs and to give you really sharp outline features and i think apple focused more on the eyes more than the hair okay so they they because they have actual depth map data and especially with portrait on the face they have extremely good depth map data um they're choosing maybe uh to portray a a wider aperture lens to simulate a wider aperture camera lens. Um, it, but it doesn't because there's things on the same plane that are in different focuses. Well, with the eye, I mean, I think the eyes in the front, the eyes, nose, and mouth are are highly in focus. And yeah. then for them, they feel like they can contour out, you know, the fuzziness in, in yeah. the hairline. Um, I have found that it takes great pictures in good lighting. Yeah. But I was hoping, jumping two generations, that low light would be better than it is. And it's still just not there. I think you just have the physical limitation of that sensor size. Yeah. Yeah. You posted a poll on Twitter this week of two photos. Yes. One shot, I assume, with the 10. Yep. The other one was shot with what? With the Pixel 2 XL. Okay. So tell us what people voted. People voted for the iPhone 10, And I think not because of the portrait mode, but because iPhone in general does a better job representing color temperature on human faces. Just to be clear, people didn't know which was which. They did not know. Yeah. And um, and a lot of people specifically di- dive, dove deep, deep into it and said, uh, if the color temperature was 
matched and the one on the left which was the pixel did better matching of the face then i would much prefer that one um, but so it was not the, a fair test if you're just j- trying to judge the fake bokeh right but it is a fair test in that in the exact same lighting conditions these are what the cameras spit out it looked like the pixel used a flash it did not it was it just washed out a little bit yeah yeah uh, i preferred the bokeh on the pixel Oh, interesting. I did too, well, but Jeremy, I preferred... Why don't you get one of those phones? I said I would if I wasn't all locked into the oh, Apple ecosystem. There you go. I preferred the bokeh on the Pixel as well, but I thought the the picture itself uh, of Danica's face looked better from the iPhone. And yeah. I think it's that washed out nature. Yeah, the washing, the, the skin tones look a lot better. Um, you know, there's also bugs in iOS. Apparently, Apple's grappling with a bug where the letter I autocorrects to a weird uh, A symbol. It's on your phone, Jeremy. Can it, I can I do one plus two plus three yet? Do you know about that? you don't know about that one? No. What is this? It's until I don't even think it's fixed yet. I think you need eleven point two. Open your calculator and quickly type one plus two plus three and tell me not no the cal- oh yeah. you're launching calculator. Yeah. It gives you twenty three because. It doesn't finish the animation for the plus button fading out before it 23. can compute. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it thinks it's one plus twenty three. Well, yeah, because it doesn't. And this work. This is true for so many calculations. The calculator doesn't work anymore until they. Uh, well, you, if you, you do update. it slowly. It'll oh work. yes, you let the animations finish. Is that just one plus two plus three, or is it if like? No, as many. It's many things. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Wow. 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 Bug. But have you seen the one? Um, you see in the, uh, yeah, if you type in the letter I, it becomes autocorrects to A and some weird icon. Autocorrects or autosuggests? Auto, autocorrects. If you hit space? Like. Oh. This uh, is. I, I was sending emails okay. earlier and yeah, it auto. That's weird. Yeah. This is a step towards iPhone 10 sentience. It's uh, just typing I whenever yeah. it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fun Twitter trend right now of people doing like. Type in like uh, I was born in and letting autocorrect fill out the whole sentence and everyone gets a different. Sentence. Oh yeah, those are fun. Stuff. Those are fun. Those are fun. So we, I think we should bring up the Samsung ad because it made a lot of press. Yes, uh, yes. So Samsung came out with a biting ad towards Apple. Very oh, clever. Last ten years of people of this guy who bought an iPhone every year for the past ten years, and there's scenes of him throughout the years, either in line in the rain, which is a kind of a low blow, but um, you know. He has his dongles in his iPhone 7, so he's charging and listening at the same time using a big fat dongle while his girlfriend is wirelessly charging her phone. Uh, he drops it in a, in a water, as does someone else, and the, the Android user is fine and his is not. Things like that throughout the years, uh, out of battery or out of uh, memory. And then at the end, of course, he jumps, gets, jumps gets the haircut. But you have seen him with the haircut. Yeah, yeah. There's somebody in, in line to get an iPhone 10 with a notch here. Yes, yeah. And and he gets an Android phone. And it, it's, it, you know, they took some of the things that were criticisms of the iPhone over the years and they used it against Apple. I just think if Apple were to do the same thing... Oh, <laughs> it would be brutal. <laughs> what? Can you imagine how bad that would like be? Like just people screaming at their phone, <laughs> turn on! Or, <laughs> they're, they're, or just viruses popping up from the Google Play there was, Store. There was actually a worse problem with the Note family a year ago, yeah, you'll, sure. you'll recall. Sure. Um, so yeah, that that's you people in glass houses, Samsung. I will, I will say, as, as the Android junkie here, um, I'm I obviously not convinced to buy the iPhone 10 just because... A thousand dollars is is like four hundred dollars too much. Yeah, uh, to to spend on a phone just for my you know personal budget and all all sorts of other things. But I am convinced that Face ID is a really novel yeah item that you know we should see in in more phones. And I'm starting to get convinced. I was very skeptical about edge to edge, but I'm starting to get convinced that edge to edge is the way to go. So if Face ID works, and really it's about the interface and the UI and not having a home button. Why didn't they do like a, a digital home button? I'm sure they experimented with the idea because you have you have tactic you have the tactic engine. It doesn't need to have, have fingerprint recognition, but just as a UI interface yeah. to make use of that bottom part of the screen. Well, we experimented with turning it on. There's an accessibility feature where you can put a permanent home button on your screen, but it obscures everything. Yep. So you don't want that. Yeah. They uh, need to design around that as yeah. well. Yeah. I don't know. Or or a side button. Make it a side button. No. A, a second side button? No. Yes. <laughs> no one wants a second side button. It's, because then, like, how do you hit? It has to be, like, thumbable. Uh-huh. There's three buttons over there, volume and power. I don't know. I don't like that at all. 
Like, and those buttons do wear out. You're talking about adding a physical button instead of a digital. And, and that's one. again why I think Apple doesn't want to have the, the thing that people do most on the phone be a physical, breakable thing, so that they have to um, pay for warranties and, and repairs. Yeah. Um, Last couple things uh, with Apple. Uh, and emojis, you know, hugely popular. I think well, time will tell. They work really well, but time will tell whether they stick. I think a lot of that will be depend on what other companies produce that will tap into that facial um, tracking. That is the most magnanimous thing you can say about and emojis. They are on fire right now, yeah. and I hope they burn in hell. <laughs> <laughs> They're ruining my life. Flaming like, poop. People just posting like videos of their animoji conversations. No, this animoji karaoke is the is the big thing. Yeah, you've watched some of those. I have seen those. I I, mean, ha- I laugh out loud at every one of them. I think they're funny. The fact that uh, people Too far. are recognizing it's not that you sending uh, animations as conversation replacements um, is useful, but the fact that you have powerful face tracking yeah. built into a phone, just like. The AR, you know, pass through AR abilities of um, of the camera and the this yeah. world tracking, inside out tracking of these cameras. Now, the fact that you have face tracking built in is a very powerful tool, and I, I think we have scratched the surface of the potential for this, like what that could mean for communications for mm-hmm. sure in the future. Just wait till they start you allow you to model your own face, so then. There's a gonna picture be, I mean, of you comes through talking. Someone's going to get like an avatar creator, you know, mm-hmm. Sims like, Mar- a Nintendo like, or something, map it to your face. And, you know, it could change communication. Like, this could be, I don't know, a viable, but it could be a just like texting, ch- stop people from making phone calls. And emojis help simplify texting. This could simplify FaceTime conversations. I think it could create a much lower bandwidth version of FaceTime. That's what where yeah. you could convert it to data rather than video. It's machinima. Uh, not that video isn't data, but you know what I mean. Much lower amount of data. Right. It basically be like, like, yeah, yeah, machinima. So what would identify you? Is it like your mm-hmm. gestures? I mean, this is something go- going from the the VR world. Something we want in you the could, VR world. If you apply machine learning to this, you could do an amazing rendering of. Uh, Artificial intelligence, you uh, you know, controlling its own face. Yeah, that'd be neat. God, this. I Come on, are you scared about that? We did the. Didn't we do the story about how they modeled President Obama's speech differently? Th- this is definitely this the is path of that in that direction, right? Like it's gonna be Mission Impossible where Tom Cruise puts an Apple iPhone in front of a villain's face and goes, "Say this sentence," <laughs> and then now they know all the facial expressions, and you can replicate the face that way, right? Um, yeah. On the rumor front, uh, of course, uh, you know, if this is the next 10 years of iPhone, what is Apple's next big product? Everyone thinks it's some type of augmented reality uh, technology, but uh, we're hoping it's a wearable. It could end up just being an evolution of the phone. Uh, but Bloomberg, Mark Gurman, who does have, who occasionally gets scoops on Apple products, is reporting that Apple is much further along than we think on an actual wearable AR pass through device. What, what, and, how far along do we think they are? Well, People are thinking like, you know, five to 10 years, right? Away years. from now? Yes. I don't yeah. think that. Yeah. Well, yeah. the report says they could have something ready by 2019 and could ship as early as 2020. I think I'm going to make some predictions. Okay. Let's hardball day prediction this. I think 2021. <laughs> okay. All right, dude. What a weird prediction. All right. Yeah. Now, are you from the future? I wish I was. <laughs> you have the sports almanac? Uh, so... You know, the it's like Apple and cars, Apples and TVs. There have been rumors forever about them working new product categories and things that have not come to fruition. Uh, they have all the money, they have all the research, they have some, they, they have the technology built into these phones. I would love for AR to become a reality. So I, I hope, just like I I want electric cars and and mm-hmm. self driving cars to become a reality. I hope that AR glasses are in the works. Um. This past weekend, I also stopped by our friend Gary Witta's house to check out something. And we'll, we will have Gary on the podcast. Future the guest, new, Gary Witta. Yep. Um, Professional podcaster, fa- again, Gary Witta. <laughs> Fou- founding <laughs> podcast host. For, this is only a test. Is that true? No, I think it was just Will and me, and then we had Gary in like, okay. when the iPhone 4 came out. Yeah. Was when we first oh, that's how you yeah. date your your years on doing this show? Well, it's what he's interested in. <laughs> uh, he's also a professional <laughs> Twitch streamer. Yes, yes. Don't screenwriter, professional Twitch streamer, and all around good guy. I like how Gary screenwriter Woodrow. is like falling down the list. <laughs> oh, no, I started off with screenwriter, um, a former editor of you know PC Gaming magazines, PC Gamer, and 
And now also the proud owner of an OLED TV. Oh, he got the LG. He got the LG C7. I, I spent an hour at his house watching content on his LG C7. And he'll tell us all about it when he joins the podcast. But my opinion is that it's freaking amazing. 65 or 55? <laughs> he got the 65. Oh, okay. my God. My review of that is, is jelly. That, <laughs> that TV is amazing. It's the best TV I've seen this year. So you you seen it in I person? I've seen it in person. I only have one. The I have the most minor complaint about that TV, but it is beautiful. So, what's the complaint? The complaint is I don't like the stand. It has a silver stand that's angled down. Okay, and yeah. it's this beautiful black surface that has you know, especially in a lot of the reviews show that uh, even um, it, in sunlight, it has some pretty good anti glare properties on it, and so. It's this beautifully flat, thin screen that has these this this great black texture, and then it has the silver angled stand All underneath right. it. I think it takes away from its sort yeah. of austere nature. That is such a minor complaint because it is stunning. The the I picture see quality. This, TV this, now. this is tough because we're not TV reviewers, right? We don't get new TVs every six months, every year. Um, we're buying TVs as consumers, where we're updating. You know, every six, seven years, right? And Gary, both he and I bought our plasma TVs uh, in 2010, seven years ago. So he's jumping from 1080 plasma to 4K HDR. And in 4K HDR right now, you have on OLED, right? Very high end, you have OLED. But you also have LCDs, LED backlit LCDs, yeah. which also do 4K HDR, which I think that's what you have, Jerry, yeah. right? I have a Sony. So 4K HDR is itself a massive jump. Regardless of the the technology behind it, massive jump over 1080p LCD or 1080p plasma, so you're gonna get those benefits. So my question is, I need to see a direct comparison side by side of what's what does OLED bring to the table over a very high end LED uh, 4K HDR screen mm-hmm. because those have been very well reviewed and those are you know like 60 percent the cost yeah. of an OLED screen at comparable large large sizes, but just looking at one TV, yeah. in this case, the high-end OLED, uh, he showed me um, Planet Earth 2 Blu-ray, 4K HDR, which is like, this is a, that's a system seller. That's a killer app right there. Unbelievable. Uh, the TV switches between HDR and non-HDR mode, when it, depending on the source. So if you're going to watch cable television, everything looks muted. Really? Mm-hmm. It's spoil, HDR spoils you. Yeah, it tells you too yeah. on screen. On which screen, is like cool. a pop up and say HDR is on. Now, Apple TV is interesting. The new Apple TV, which supports 4K HDR, it does some up converting and brightness and makes everything 4K HDR. Hmm. So it scales everything up to 4K and brightens everything up to HDR, regardless if the source was coded for HDR or not. So menus are brighter. That's mm-hmm. natural and they look great. The, the screensavers are now 4K HDR. They look great. Are those screensavers native HDR? I no? don't know. Okay, uh, they they may have been processed again to be HDR, yeah. but I, I can't, you can't tell because Apple doesn't let you switch that off yet. Okay, but ne- some Netflix content definitely there's some stuff that was not HDR. Yeah, but they boost up the brightness and it l- sometimes looks a little saturated. Did you try the Defenders? I did try the Defenders, and Defenders good. Like Kimmy Schmidt was great in, mm. in 4K HDR. Um, it's weird because source there's no one set top box has everything, which became very clear. Gary had Xbox One S, which has 4K HDR playback. He had the built-in app on the LG TV, the WebOS based app, and he also had Apple TV. And we were constantly switching between them to find the right source of content. Like mm-hmm. YouTube 4K HDR only works on the built-in TV thing. Yeah. Uh, Apple TV doesn't have that, um, but. Apple TV does the upscaling really well for certain things. So you're still going to be switching. But you're buying a TV for, what, seven years is the life of a TV yeah. at this point? And hopefully so you that. have to imagine that 4K HDR content is going to become the norm in a year or two. It's worth pointing out, though, that, that there is a standard for HDR. There are multiple standards for mm-hmm. HDR, but that TVs don't have to support the full uh, color gamut. This it, one does support all of them. Right. All of those standards. Right. No, but not the full. I don't think anything yeah. supports the full color gamut yeah. of the standards. So, like, we're still inching towards full compatibility. Yeah. It's just, like, how much depth can you buy right now? And well, so, this sounds like a pretty good deal. Which makes it a really 
interesting time. The content is we can tell it's reaching that tipping point of, of getting there. There's definitely stuff to watch now. It's not ubiquitous, but all the places are, all the distributors and, and, con- uh, and content services are pushing toward it. Uh, but there's, it's still very expensive. I, by the way, I'm not suggesting anyone buy this TV, even though it's gorgeous, because it's like 2800 bucks. Yeah. So, uh, like, you can't justify that increase of 3x over, you know, a similar, uh, you know, OLED in the or LED. That's, that's a, a lot of money for that's that TV. That's relative, man. Like, 2800 bucks wouldn't have gotten you a 65 inch TV at all seven years ago. Uh, totally true. But I'm just saying, I think there's models that get you probably 85 percent, 90, maybe even 95 percent of the way. Yeah, and, and that are a thousand bucks. Big deal. If you're talking about going from 65 inch. Uh, 55 to 65, that is uh, another like 40% jump in price, almost double. Is that true? Yeah. Wow. I know it really ramps up after 65. There, There's a Netflix video called Sparks, by the way, if you ever watch mm. uh, 4K HDR TV again. Yeah. And uh, that's just meant to demo 4K HDR. Oh. And it's 60 hertz. And it's a guy with uh, welding. Hmm. Uh, the TV, yeah. We'll have Gary on talk more about the TV, but uh, I want to see in person. Now, I haven't now seen I sports see... on, on that TV. What about so video games? Period. Like, what's the latency like? Did you Ooh. play anything? Uh, yes. So you played Forza on the Xbox One S, which is renders at 1080 and that gets upscaled. I'm more concerned about the controls. Is there any uh, lag or anything? Not that I can tell. Okay. Um, and he seemed happy with it. So speaking of video games, the other... Uh, you know, as set top boxes support high resolutions, you know, we had the PS4 Pro, and this week we have released the Xbox One X, X, Project Scorpio. Okay. Anyone little, here, anyone here buying little that? Little fanfare. I know. Isn't that strange? This is a big deal. This is a technically a mid generation with backward compatibility support, but this is like a new console from Microsoft. Most powerful console ever. Ever. And yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see. I don't hear of the lines. I don't. I don't. It's it's easy to get one. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not in the Xbox uh, console generation. This generation, uh, and I think a lot of it's because you know they don't have the exclusives. Yes, they'll they'll own some. You'll get the Halo on that. But right now, you know, PS4 Pro launched early has 4K support. Uh, There's the, a difference between a console that looks better and a console that runs games that you can't run on other consoles. Right. So it's it's not a generation change. I, it's I just, don't see myself getting back in the console game with the upgrades to VR that I've done. Yeah, because it, like all of that investment, I'm going to keep playing on computer at the at, on PC for a while. Yeah, and uh, and if you're going to buy a new console, you know, it seems like Nintendo Switch is the one to get this year. Well, it has two world class games, right? Yep. Yeah, best ten, games of ten all time. Tens. Oof. Oof. All right, let's jump through the rest of the tech stories pretty quickly. Uh, who here is on Twitter? Two eighty, twenty characters. All on of Twitter? us. Twitter, Oliver, all of us I've, apparently. Yeah, it's like everyone got two hundred eighty characters as of yesterday. I've made one tweet that was longer than one hundred forty characters, and I feel dirty. The shower did not clean away <laughs> the stench of the two eighty off of me. Uh, you know, I have to retract a little of the ire I expressed when they initially said people getting two eighty. It's not that bad. To see longer, slightly longer tweets in your timeline. I just hope they don't go crazy and go it, go all Facebook on us. It's if it encourages people to do 280 as the norm. Yeah, that's that's what I don't want to see because then your timeline shrinks. Then yes, it takes so much longer to read them. Oh no, that's not what I'm complaining about. Because also, no, like I people thread, <laughs> people also thread stuff. Whatever, people get over this in a week when Twitter d- does something else bad. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Well, maybe at least they're not releasing glasses because that did not do well for Snapchat. Snapchat Aww. Spectacles, by some estimates, lost $40 million, have $40 million of unsold inventory in the Snapchat Spectacles. What a turnaround from when they had the vending machines where... What? There, uh, so they launched the product in these vending machines and there was like hours and hours of lines to get them out of the vending machine. Exclusivity is a huge marketing tool and, and selling I, point. And I think they overestimated demand based off of that initial run through. Yeah. And plus they're hitting IPO, so they need to build up their hardware business. Uh, that's that's unfortunate. So what does that mean? Like they're discontinued? I think they've got to re- reevaluate their strategy. Okay. Yeah. If you're looking for a cheap pair of sunglasses, snap spectacles. There you go. Um Another unfortunate bit of news, last bit of tech. Uh, we had here some layoffs in the video games community. Telltale is uh, has done, gone through some restructuring, and a couple dozen employees of Telltale, uh, Telltale Games, um, had to be let go. Unfortunately, so which which sucks. 
a lot. Yeah. I, you know, I couldn't find this news. I saw Ken Levine of uh, R- Irrational, right? Yeah. I saw him tweet that they, he loves Telltale games, and if any writers from Telltale are looking for work, give him a call. And I thought, that's a nice thing to do. And then I couldn't find any news about Telltale. Has the whole studio closed down? No, 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 no. no, no. So they did, issue, they did issue press release, and it was 90 employees, which is, that's a, that's a lot. That's a quarter of their work. Yeah. Yeah. And so their previous announced projects, you know, Batman, Wolf Among Us, Walking Dead are still going to be continued. But um, it's, I, I think it, it sucks. It, I mean, I have this, no, there's no reason behind it. Uh, you know, there could be engineering. It could be that, you know, their own game engines were dated and they want to jump on a Unity or Unreal. Huh. Um, but yeah. It's, I, I hope it's not a walk away from that kind of game storytelling that Telltale has because it's it's so unique. It's so beautiful. It's so enjoyable. Um, it's just sad, but it's also the state of video game companies right now, isn't it? I feel like we've covered a lot of these lately. Well, yeah. a lot of the video, the, the ebb and flow of video game companies is they, they ramp up in order to produce a game and then there's a lot of downtime between titles and they can't afford to keep everybody on staff so they have to let people go and then when they need more people, they either hire contractors or get more full-timers. So it's it's... It's not unheard of if they can't keep some sort of leapfrog cycle going where there's always enough projects in in the queue. It's tough. All right. That does it for uh, technology news. Uh, Before we move on to our next segment, I also want to thank the other sponsor of this week's episode, and that is Chef Steps and the Jewel Sous Vide by Chef Steps. Uh, Are you a dinner party host looking for a foolproof way to get perfect meats, poultry, and fish with Jewel Sous Vide by Chef Steps? Every home cook can create chef-level dishes thanks to the precise temperature control. Jewel makes sure you never food your food will never over or undercook, so you're free to focus on your guests or whip up some amazing sides. There are more than a hundred recipes in the Video Rich Jewel app to help you cook almost every protein from meat to poultry to fish to eggs, plus desserts, veggies, and more. And if your guests are running late or your apps and cocktails are taking longer than expected, it's not a problem. Jewel is ready when you are so your food won't overcook. The Jewel is perfect food every time. To get yours, visit chefsteps.com slash Jewel and use the offer code TEST, T-E-S-T, to get $15 off for a limited time. That's chefsteps.com slash Jewel, J-O-U-L-E, with the offer code TEST. I'm a pinball nerd. Pin, 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 pin. Just the right point. Finally, pinball. Pinball. That makes me very happy. There's a new pinball game on the horizon, gentlemen, and it is Marvel based, so I know I have your attention. It is Guardians of the Galaxy. Whoa, made by Stern Pinball. Stern Pinball. So, okay. they, yeah, they make four games a year, so you're going to hear from me yeah, yeah. that often. What were the other games this year? That they did? Yes. Star Wars. Yes, of course, yes. That was that was a big deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, then uh, before that was Aerosmith. Yep. Um, I don't think there's been anything since Star Wars. All right, okay. In any case, uh, Guardians is uh, it's in a new platform. It's got a big LCD panel in the back. You know, so it's got the movie footage and all that stuff. Um, it's, de- it's developed by John Borg, who did like Tron and I want to say X-Men. In any case. Tron Legacy? Yes. And uh, it's got a big Groot toy. So you got Groot in the back, and he, he, you hit his mouth, and he opens his mouth, and you get the balls in his mouth. And then for at multi-ball, all the balls come out of his mouth. We're you saying like the Groot, <laughs> the big head <laughs> yeah, yeah. is in the back. It's big not head. just like a small action figure. No, no, no. The head is like a fourth the width of are you looking? Field, you're looking at the I'm picture? Photo, and his yeah. hands That's in the come limited. out from the side. That's in the LE. Oh. You got to pay extra for the hands. Ooh. And I don't think they do anything. Like, But there are hands that can come all over the play field. And this is turning into an outro. <laughs> <laughs> Not interested? No, I just think there's so many euphemisms have been oh, said yeah, in the yeah, last yeah, that's 30 true, seconds. That's true, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Um, so I don't know. It looks pretty straightforward in terms of the flow. Uh, and um, there you go. If you're, It's got pretty artwork. It's not hand drawn. It's like all photoshoppy, but it's got all the mm. colors you expect from Guardians of the Galaxy. Why not hand drawn? They did so well with Ghostbusters, didn't they? Yeah, that that was a nice looking game, as was Aerosmith. But uh, they, when they're dealing with these licensors, sure, uh, they're very particular. I like the Guardians theme, so I bet you this this has good music. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see what they license because they typically don't spend a whole lot of money on the music. Oh. so it might be sound alikes. Fingers crossed, they got some of the good stuff. That's all I got for you. Now 
it's time for a moment of science. All right, we're going to kick it back to fifth grade. Oh, yeah. Uh, back about like elementary, middle school, we all learned how the first humans came to the Americas. How did they come here? By they, boat. They walked over. They walked over. Oh, that, that version. They, they, they walked, walked over where? They walked over from Alaska. Yeah. yeah, through the Bering Strait. Yes. When there was not ocean coverage of that and the land mass emerged. It's okay. <laughs> No, I'm with you now. I'm with you now. <laughs> and that was, that's listed, um, it w- it's always been sort of guessed that that was about 13,500 years ago. And yeah. the, the humans that came over are referred to as, as the Clovis tribe. Uh, and there's still still solid evidence that that happened, but there's emerging evidence now that that's not how the first humans came to the Americas. In fact, uh, in a recent paper in Science, it's now really disputed how they came because a group of scientists have been using ROVs to look at submerged landmass off the coast of the Americas, both South America and North America, on either coast, and have found remnants of villages along the coastlines that might indicate that uh, humans did not just cross the Bering Strait. They, they walked across these coastal areas or potentially even got there by boat. That's what I said. And they... Um, <laughs> had a curve, Jerry. And these... Uh, Coastal villages predate when the Clovis walked over the Bering Strait. So they're up to 14,000 or 15,000 years ago. And then there's even even weirder. There's a site off the coast of of California, I believe, that looks like a site where mastodons were slaughtered, which looks like something that humans would have been involved Mm. in that goes back almost 15,000 years. And we have no idea how they actually came over here. And because of where this evidence is, it's basically all submerged underwater, we may never be able to know. But that idea that the first humans came across the Bering Strait is now soundly not in line with what scientists think. So when you say human, it's not strictly Homo sapien, right? No, no. These are Homo sapiens. Really? 15,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, anyways, stay tuned for that. No, it's going to be years before any more papers come out about this topic. All right. Chris Hadfield. Our yes. Friend of tested. Yes. We can go out on a limb and call that. He tweeted out something interesting um, recently uh, about Mars terraforming. And I think we should we talk about what he tweeted out. So uh, the idea of terraforming Mars is problematic because there's no there's a very thin atmosphere on Mars. It's about one sixth the thickness of the of the Earth atmosphere, one sixth to one tenth. And part of the reason is that is the solar wind from our sun has basically pushed off the atmosphere and there's not enough magnetic shielding to deflect that solar wind away to build up enough of an atmosphere to exist. Uh, so NASA has a, a, a future, a future kind of futuristic meeting where they talk about things in, in the lens of, of 2050. And one of the, their astro, um, uh, astrobiologists, uh, I'm going to get it wrong, but one of their, um, uh, uh, scientists from the Planetary Science Division proposed an idea that was really intriguing that Chris, Chris tweeted out is instead of uh, terraforming Mars, what if we put an object out beyond Mars at a point we'll just call L1 that essentially is a source of a big magnetic field that would allow the a magnetic field to distribute backwards across Mars and then over time its atmosphere will grow. Whoa. Because you're deflecting the solar um, solar wind away. How big of an object is that? It has to be a pretty big. It has to generate a pretty big magnetic field. Um, uh, and so there was some initial scaling down of it. And Chris tweeted it out. It's just it's not realistic. It's just sort of a proposal for a very futuristic idea. Hmm. Um, uh, and uh, but it's so interesting that this is the kind of conversation that's actually happening behind the scenes at NASA. Is there's potentially more interesting ways to terraform Mars than just actually terraforming it, quote unquote. Uh, last story of the week, we have um, involved science and politics. Lamar Smith, who has been the head of the House Science Committee, uh, has stepped down. He His tenure, which I think has been the, the last few years, has been marked with a lot of investigations into uh, research at the National Science Foundation, uh, even some scientists uh, accusing him of, of persecuting them uh, and, and channeling out research. 
Um, this is interesting when combined with the fact that uh, we have a new NASA administrator that was confirmed this week, Jim Bridenstine, who is a former congressman from Oklahoma. Um, I think him, Lamar Smith's tenure is not was not well loved by scientists, and they're eagerly looking forward somebody else coming into the in, into that role that may present um, a different step forward for scientists. That contention has not been beneficial for science, the contention between that House Science Committee, um, because it has really created an atmosphere that there is a, a war between science and, and politicians. And I think that's something we have to move past. So the replacement hasn't been announced yet, but I think it'll be interesting to keep an eye on in the coming weeks. And that's it. We need more scientists in politics. Yes? We need the right scientists in politics. Yes. <laughs> The VR Minute, virtual reality this week. We're actually running out of time, so we're going to cut, let's get through VR pretty quickly. Uh, Some people tune in just for this. I know, I know. Uh, okay, what do you want to talk about? Well, uh, we were excited about Dash at the Oculus Connect, and yes. we have found out just, uh, I think, yesterday, although someone maybe someone just figured it out, that in the latest uh, developer notes for um, from Oculus about Unity is that they, there's a small little note in there. They expect to launch Dash early December. Whoa! So maybe that is great news. Maybe one month from now. Oh my goodness, that would be exciting. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited. In beta, mm -hmm. nonetheless, yes. fun, yep. fun to play with. Yes, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, and we'll be definitely testing that when that comes out. Uh, there's also a launch this week an Indiegogo campaign with someone we are familiar with. Oh Jamie my goodness, Heinemann. this is crazy. Really interesting. He's working with a company to make what they call VR shoes, basically treadmill shoes that can react and respond to users' intentions and movements to give you some type of locomotion in VR. So he, his shoes have motors on them, treads, basically like tank treads that will go in the opposite direction of your walk. So it's like a treadmill, but on the shoes itself. Exactly. A reverse treadmill. Yeah, I guess it's the same thing. It's yeah. a less janky version of all of those VR treadmills that we've seen. So the question is... One, how do you get the two shoes to sync up? And two, why do they have to sync up? Uh, because of your motion. Yeah, aren't they just both independently doing the opposite of whatever that foot is doing? No matter what, they have to keep no, your body no, no, still. No, because they need. To, you don't start when your foot. The idea is once your foot plants on the ground. Yeah, it, the the treadmill's already in motion to get your foot moving. It's not like you push off of it, right? So it needs to have, it needs to know that okay. your intention is forward movement. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like it might just always respond in that smallest second, in that smallest moment, you know, that it would just respond so low, very the low opposite, yeah, to, to right. whatever motion so it So it needs senses. good detection of your foot's direction, each individual foot's intentionality. Yeah, exactly. But also it needs to be omnidirectional. Yeah. That's the tough part. Why? Because you're going to walk backwards sometimes. Is that what you mean? More than backwards. Side, you sideways. Mean, not, I don't most know. people walk not just in a straight line. For in a game, strafing is important. I right? don't know. But looking at the prototypes of these on his Indiegogo video, it doesn't look like it does any, any of that. Right. It's forward and, it looks like forward and backward. Yeah. There is no product here. It's about making a prototype, a seventh generation prototype. And even Jamie, genius that he is, says this is a very hard problem. It, absolutely. And I think tackling the problem is, I mean, it, we want these things. It, in my mind, it's like rollerblades, right? If I'm a roller skates. Like, I'm no good with roller skates. And, you know, anyone who's put on roller skates can try to run in place. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, that, but with more control, with motors added. I have to say, when I first saw this, I thought this was totally fake. Oh, yeah? Yeah, because it just seems like such a... It, like, initially, when I came on the page, I'm like, this can't be real. And it was, like, stock images of Jamie yeah. <laughs> pasted on the Indiegogo. I think the challenges are going to be as much in the software as in the hardware. Oh, and very that's much. That's where so. the, the biggest risks are probably with this. And then don't you have to have a developer that actually makes a game that's yeah. going to utilize this, right? right? So, right. so he's yeah. asking for 50000 which isn't that much money. Yeah. Unfortunately, he's only raised 14%. He's got a month, it's only month, month been left. up a day or two. That's true. Good luck, Jamie. Yep. Uh, now, Logitech also interesting product that probably a little more practical for VR, something I've been asking for a long time, a keyboard, because they're a maker of gaming accessories, with amount for a vive tracker and software that you track your keyboard in games yeah this wanna, is what i want i want to use this absolutely so it's called the logic bridge work with vive system of course with steam vr uh, but they only have 50 developer kits so far 
So 50 developer kits, 150 bucks, plus you need the $100 tracker and the Vive. Um, it's something that I, I, I wish they would have just put the sensors in the keyboard. Oh yeah, that makes that makes sense. However, if you're going, like I would like to see a adapter so you could mount this onto any keyboard, and then some configuration process that lets you say where the keys are. Right. And then you have it. It was compatible with any keyboard. Right. Right. That'd right. Be, that'd be cool. Yes. I mean, you know, maybe a little or geeky. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But Logitech makes the keyboards. They want to sell the keyboards. Mainly, I, the confusion for this for me is I can't see my hands still. So I, I want to see how easy is it to use a keyboard when you can't see your hands, and what. But if you know where the keyboard is, that's still good. <laughs> no, that's still a, that's still a positive. Yeah. But also, what can they turn that keyboard into in VR? Like that, there's real magic potential there. So it actually makes a lot more sense if you're designing a keyboard to actually work with VR. Like if that is actually a user, uh, a model that you want, yeah, you want the keyboard itself to have trackers, so not have an external tracker, right? To work with whatever tracking system, either IR blinking IR lights for the Oculus system or um, the the photodiodes for um, for uh, Vive. Uh, the Vive. Uh, but you'd also want capacitive sensors on the keys, so you know when your fingers are resting on the keys, and that would then activate, you know, light them up in VR. I suppose, yeah. Right? You rest yeah. your fingers on the keys, and then it they glow in VR, so it knows where your fingers are resting. Uh huh. I got that's a compromise from not being able to see your hands. That would be right. useful, right? Um, and then uh, another Kickstarter, something kind of interesting: Zeph VR, an accessory for the Rift to mount fans underneath your headset. <laughs> so what's crazy about this is that I actually I thought about this. I wanted to make a fan that sits on your desk that is VR controllable. I think this makes a lot of sense. So. I, I put this on there. I, I came across this. I put this on there just because I have fond memories of when we did Birdly yeah. all, all those years ago about the variable speed fan that was there. And it, it occurred to me, it's like, you don't actually need developers to do much to make this happen. Right. Potentially. They don't have to code for this. Why not? Uh, because you can have it it sense sort of y your movement to a, a source of, uh, associate to the, the what? wind speed the no. tracking movement or or uh, or the game it has to do with the game design though right or whatever the experience well, is sure it has to have some connection to the game design but I'm just saying I don't think you need to have game I think that's their argument is that you don't need to have exclusive games made to utilize this technology right. you want but you still want developers like if windlands was going to incorporate something like this. They need to code in the yeah. fact that you're swinging, your velocity is this much, and exactly. therefore your what, fan What they say is it listens to the actual sounds of the game ah. and picks up the wind in the game and then does, so does the fan that audio processing. Way. Yeah. How does Got it know it. the difference between like a drum solo and a, a bunch of wind? I don't know. That's, yeah. why, that, I don't that's know. why it's a Kickstarter, but that's their <laughs> idea is that you don't have, <laughs> you know, people develop yeah. for it. But, but yeah, like... What is it interesting to you? As I love it. No, no, no. I, I, I think it's a great idea. I'm not sure about mounting it on your face. Yeah. <laughs> that, I well, mean, it's got to be somewhere. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe just put it on your desk or mount it somewhere on your monitor or something. But I do think a fan is a great idea for a sense of haptics feedback for, for VR. Yep. Um, we've been playing. Uh, can we say this? <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to what we've been testing? Uh oh, it's still 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 it's in the still VR, VR minute. All yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, hmm. don't know if we can say this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, we've yeah, been yeah. playing something. Yes, we've been simply playing something that's been coming out next week. And if you watch this week's episode of Projections, you'll hear our thoughts on it. When does that come out? Uh, I I believe uh, this Friday. Okay. All yes. right. That's interesting. <laughs> Was it though? Is <laughs> is it? Does it involve hardware? No, okay. software. It's just software. Okay. Just software. All right. Yes. Were you involved in the shooting of this episode? We uh, have two. Th we have multiple things. Oh, okay. All right. So are we done? With do we are we testing anything this week or just going straight to the credits? Let's go straight to the credits. We, right. We've run out of time, unfortunately, with some other shoots to go on. Um, there's a bunch of great stuff on the site. Um, we have more from Adam's trip to Budapest and his visit to the Blade Runner set. Um, we have uh, Designer Con is this coming weekend, so I'll be there. What's uh, that? Designer Con. It's a convention for uh, toy designers and oh, um, neat. and people who do custom figures. Uh, we actually had a visitor yesterday, uh, Michael Singh, who made the uh, Codename Colossus. Remember we built Heck as yeah. a yeah. built. He was in. He's here from Singapore on his way to Designer Con and brought his new mech. So uh, he's also running a Kickstarter. For Didn't you, you describe it, it also as like the holiday party, the Etsy 
the better version of those Etsy oh, yeah. um, holiday marts. Oh, totally. Yes. Um, and uh, we'll be back next week. And I think we may have a special guest in the podcast next week um, to, to talk about Animoji. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Happy birthday, Kishore. Thank you. Yeah, Thank dude. you. Out Thank there you for everyone. listening. And do we have an outro? We do. From Damien Walls. Hi there. I didn't see you. That's it. Dinosaur DNA, we just use frogs. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye.